Hello everyone, and I'm very sorry for the six minute delay. We had some technical issue regarding the voice and video. Thank you for joining us for today's webinar. On the behalf of the American Petroleum Professionals of Iranian Heritage, APPIH, it's our great honor to start another webinar on the subject of the challenges in HC gas injection in two emerging areas, deep offshore and onshore unconventional oil by Dr. Reza Fasihi. It's our great honor that today we have Dr. Fasihi. Dr. Fasihi has over 38 years of experience in research, development, and field application of reservoir management. He is currently working as a distinguished advisor for BHP Petroleum and responsible for assurance on global subsurface projects transferring new technology and IOR applications. He worked previously in major oil companies such as BP, Amoco, and Arco. His body work uh, has covered many topics, including thermal recovery, rock and fluid characterization, reservoir uh, description and dynamics management, and challenging reservoirs, uh, <clears throat> primary production, water flooding, and EOR. He recently published an outstanding book entitled Low Energy Processes for Unconventional Oil Recovery. I would like to thank spe specifically Dr. Uh, Fassi for accepting our invitation and without further delay, I'm transferring the microphone to him for starting his presentation. Thank you, Dr. Fassi. Um, thank you very much. Um, Hamid Reza for scheduling and organizing this talk. And I would like to also thank um, those who are attending this, this uh, webinar. Um, it's an honor for me to also be a presenter in this uh, um, setting. Um, I've, I've talked to Hamid Reza already about this, uh, where um, there have been a lot of good talks so far and they have been outstanding. So I'd like to uh, thank all of the members of the board of uh, APPIH and the uh, members of the um, uh, organizing committee for um, scheduling these great outstanding talks. Anyway, um, uh, the topic that I chose today uh, for this presentation, as Hamid has mentioned, is about challenges in hydrocarbon um, gas injection in two emerging areas. And the reason I chose these two emerging areas, deep offshore and onshore, is because these are the two areas that are currently competing for um, capital. And, uh, and that's why it's important to see what are the commonalities and uh, differences between these two areas and uh, what are the benefits of applying EOR in offshore versus um, unconventional. Um, Hamid, is my voice okay? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Okay, good, thank you. So this is the agenda of my talk. Um, first, I'll be uh, uh, describing the resources uh, for offshore versus onshore. Then I'll talk about the price impact uh, then I'll uh, explain features of EOR in these two areas, and then challenges in implementing uh, these technologies. Then I'll talk about the technical limits on recovery factor. Uh, then I'll switch on to gas flooding mechanism, uh, discuss pilot testing, uh, then go into uh, GOM applications, and um, then I'll switch on to onshore application, then I'll uh, conclude my talk. In terms of uh, sources of remaining oil in place, um, first I'm gonna talk about GOM, Gulf of Mexico. And on this chart you will see on the uh, vertical axis is neogen recoverable and trapped oil volume. And the right-hand side are the technologies that are needed to uh, uh, recover the, the oil that we have um, shown here. As you can see, 
we currently have about uh, 10 billion barrels that are projected to be recovered with conventional means. This gives you about 32% recovery factor for the conventional methods for uh, offshore technologies. Now, you have about 5 billion non-connected to wells, and then you have got another 5 billion for capillary bound oil, and another 5 billion for limited displacement drive, and potentially another 4 billion for, uh, for poor sweep. So the technology that need to be applied, first of all, the well technology, obviously the first thing that's gonna be common amongst all of these. It will be used um, through smart uh, completion, through uh, deviated horizontal wells or other methods to be able to get those non-connected to wells uh, resources and, and so on and so forth. Then pumping, pumping an artificial leaf would be another technology sub, such as subsea multi-phase pumping that will be needed for untapping some of the oil here. And then we talk about the application of IOR, EOR for capillary bound oil. And um, additionally, water gas injection and pressure maintenance will be required to get additional recovery through limited displacement drive and, and the poor sweep. In terms of unconventional oil, the EIA estimated uh, technically recoverable shale oil and shale gas in the United States is about 15 billion. Now, assuming a 50% recovery factor, uh, incremental recovery by just gas injection into shale oil, you could be uh, recovering another seven and a half billion barrels. So this is just the resource space for shale in the United States. Additionally, it could be ap applicable in so many other places. As always, the price uncertainty is a key driver and potentially a key risk for EOR as well. Notice that here there are three projections their low oil price, which is about $40 between now and 2050. Then a low oil and gas supply, which is shown uh, going all the way uh, to 80 in 2030 and get to 120. And finally, the high oil price. I'm not sure whether high oil price will be achievable or not, but that's just one of the scenarios. So if you look at the price forecast, Generally speaking, 40 is pretty much marginal for application of UR for uh, unconventional shale. You need up to $80 per barrel for offshore UR application. So just keep that in mind. We'll be discussing this further in this presentation. Another aspect of this is the impact of price also impacts the resource base on different types of oil. Here you notice that I've got on the vertical axis, the oil price ensuring a profitability of about bigger than 10%. So generally speaking for enhanced oil recovery, as I mentioned, you need to have between 40 to 80 to be able to recover the oil. Now to other resources such as extra heavy oil and oil shales and so on, you, are, you need additional um, price incentives to be able to recover those. Now let's talk about key features of ER application in onshore and offshore. Notice that on the first column, I have got the key features and then the properties and the potential you can call this a screening criteria than you need to have for onshore shale versus offshore gum. For the onshore shale, generally speaking, the key features are the reservoir pressure is probably a somewhat higher than normal, but close to normal, especially when you're dealing with um, uh, uh, post primary production. Offshore gum is generally you're dealing with uh, overpressure and higher pressure. 
Reservoir depth is typically less than 10,000 feet, and then you go to offshore, generally bigger than 15,000. On the well spacing, you, are very, you have very close well spacing for onshore, but wide spacing close to 1,000 feet in the offshore environment. Well cost, less than 10 million on the onshore, bigger than 100 million offshore. Number of wells, uh, generally between um, eight per section, but you have a limited um, available slots on an offshore uh, platform for any additional um, infill. Well, intervention is low cost, um, costly for offshore, uh, and then we are talking about well rates that uh, the, the best well you can get is less than 5,000 in uh, uh, onshore, but generally between, uh, you know, 10 to 20,000 for, um, for um, offshore. And recovery factor is 5 to 10% for onshore and 10 to 30% for offshore. And then there are other criteria here that uh, probably for the sake of time, we want to uh, just look at them, but just move on to the next slide. The other thing is significant challenges in offshore and onshore application. On the onshore shale, fracture connectivity is the biggest thing. You're talking about unconstrained rock connectivity. You need to have a good fracture height you potentially could have asphalt in dropout on, on shale, and then you are generally diffusion limited. Wells are generally instrumented, but then you need uh, emerging predictive models and imaging tools to be able to monitor your EOR. In offshore GAM, reservoir connectivity is obviously number one. Then you are dealing with large pays, so the structure should be kind of large for application of EOR. You, do, you are dealing with the stratigraphic complexity, and also you could have asphaltine problem in reservoir. You are also mobility limited, uh, and uh, although the operators are moving toward using smart wells, but uh, we are still dealing with limited smart well application. And also similar to shale, you need better imaging tools. So if you start with just back to basic, what are the key uh, uh, aspects of a typical recovery factor? What are controlling? If I look at recovery factor, it's a function of first poor scale efficiency, then a drainage. Then we are talking about the sweep efficiency and which is both aerial and vertical, and finally the cutoff. And the cutoff could be a reservoir energy cutoff, it could be a facility uh, limitation or facility life, lifetime or commercial cutoff in terms of the oil price or other things. For onshore shale, we are dealing on the technical limit. We're dealing with limited diffusion, limited SRV, complex fracture network, and between five to 10 years of life for a well. And that gives you a bad 25% uh, recovery factor. For an offshore environment in a gum, you generally are dealing with a good kind of reservoir uh, structure. Wells are in compartment which require additional injection well. You are dealing with good uh, sweep and the life of asset is pretty long. And that generally gives you in the 40% range recovery factor. So now let's talk about why do we want to have EOR application and what are the benefits? The key EOR that uh, I have focused here is basically offshore miscible gas injection. Now, there are three things that are really important with this uh, miscible gas injection. First, incremental oil is obtained from targeting capillary bound oil and by increasing sweep efficiency. Gravity drainage enhancement in dipping reservoir is very critical. 
And then pressure maintenance is, is something that you need to have, especially if you don't have a good aquifer support. Now, for an offshore environment, generally speaking, you need to have at least 5,000 feet of depth in order to be able to withstand high injection pressure. And part of this causes the top seal integrity that should be looked at whenever you are not talking about gas injection. The second is MMP is a critical design parameter. Generally speaking, you want to have an MMP that is below your um, at least initial reservoir pressure and preferably below your abandonment pressure. Compression facility requires additional development. And part of this is either you need to have enough space on your platform for any uh, compression or facility, or you need to have some sort of advancement in subsea compression aspect. And then of course, like anything else, flow assurance is a very important aspect of the, this EOR application. Another aspect is you need to have access to a good gas supply. So we have seen a lot of uh, development on onshore installation of cryogenic processes for nitrogen injection in an offshore environment or bringing that cryogenic process uh, in the offshore platform. But as I said, the additional weight on, on the platform is a requirement that you probably need to be looking at is from day one of your field development. Or alternatively, you could be injecting produced offshore gas <clears throat> into your reservoir. Of course, as part of the environmental aspect and, and being more uh, environmentally friendly, CO2 injection <clears throat> has been uh, discussed as part of uh, uh, CO2 sequestration. And uh, there are some governmental incentive right now for any kind of CO2 injection for both EOR as well as for the storage that could be um, a, a good source of gas for EOR. But the main issue is the pilot testing. Pilot te testing is needed. However, in an offshore environment, the same preparation that is needed for a pilot testing is needed for a full field testing. And hence, the idea of just limited pilot testing the way we are used to in an on off onshore environment, in an offshore environment probably is not gonna happen. So basically what you can consider pilot testing is the first phase of development of EOR in an offshore environment, okay? And at the same time, you need to look at this stepwise de-risking strategies and also a smart completion and, and the surveillance method in terms of making sure that you know where your injected gas is going. For a shale uh, environment, uh, pilot consideration is needed and many operators have been applying uh, le learnings from a pilot, a limited pilot, and they have been expanding their, their field tests to more than just one, one block and extend, expanding their, their ER operation. So that is something for shale that is required. And, and generally speaking, uh, you, you start with a good part of the field and then you extend it to other wells. But the key thing here again is you need to have available or desirable hydro hydrocarbon gas for injection. You need to have vertical and lateral containment. And then uh, you need to have enough distance from other operators because you don't want to mess up with their operation by breaking through your injected gas in their producer. And, and then the greater distance from highly mature and stimulated areas is important. Uh, you don't wanna have any kind of, uh, such as, such as uh, you know, gas breakthrough going to your uh, low pressure zone uh, in the adjacent blocks or something. And the other part is you don't wanna, uh, 
uh, create issues with your production by applying UR in areas where you have a lot of water production. So in order to really start a good pilot test in Shell, the first thing is you need to really characterize your recovery, recovery mechanism. Are you really dealing with um, miscible injection or immiscible? Definitely you are talking about cycling gas in terms of half and half, but then there could be aspects of swelling, diffusion and desorption and miscibility data that you need to probably obtain through some lab testing. You need to be able to simulate your recovery mechanism and come up with some sort of a forecast in order to input that in your economic calculation and see whether that's gonna make any sense to run this. The facility needs to be designed properly and that's part of the reason that ER has been successful by some operators because they have optimized the use of facilities for ER application. For example, a compressor could be shared between 18 wells by designing the proper orientation of the wells and so on. And um, develop cost and schedule estimates, perform economics, and then the most important part that is shown at the bottom is you need to solicit management and partners approval before you even think about uh, carrying this kind of project. Now I'm gonna switch to some of the examples of the application of UR in offshore. Then I'll move on into application of UR in, in offshore environment. Um, in onshore environment. So first on the offshore recovery method, there have been some uh, water flood um, application in many areas, including Gulf of Mexico, North Sea and others. Polymer inject injection have been tried in North Sea and some offshore African reservoirs. CO2 injection has been tried in some uh, shallow onshore uh, reservoirs. Nitrogen injection has been tried um, in US offshore, Mexico, North Sea. Thermal has been applied in Venezuela offshore. And then hydrocarbon gas injection specifically has been applied in uh, offshore Norway. And there are at least three miscible um, projects and three miscible ones that are shown here um, that um, have been uh, under hydrocarbon gas injection. Um, within my company, BHP, we have been looking at um, uh, one of the giant fields that uh, we are operating. And in this one, the structure of the reservoir is ideal. As you can see, it's kind of steeply dipping. It's made of several uh, sands. And these sands are pretty uh, good in terms of connectivity and so on. And uh, an outcrop resembling the structure of this reservoir is shown in the bottom of the slide. As you can see, thick sands with some shale layers intercepted, they are, they are uh, basically a characteristic of this reservoir. So we have been doing a lot of studies in terms of lab as well as simulation and, and so on. Um, and I'm gonna show you a couple of um, lab tests that we have carried um, on this field. Uh, in terms of, uh, uh, First thing is, um, let me just show you both of these. In terms of miscibility pressure, we, we have carried the slim tube displacement test and have identified the minimum miscibility pressure to be about 4,400 PSI in this field. Now, knowing that the abandonment pressure in this field would be around 7,000, this is a very ideal condition to have for miscible injection. The other aspect of this is um, asphalting precipitation. This reservoir has about 8% uh, asphalting content. And generally speaking, even under uh, just the primary production, we do have some asphalting problem around uh, the producer, but we have done additional testing with the gas injection. And as you can see, with the additional injection of gas, 
this envelope for asphalt in precipitation is opening up more. And based on this data, you can see that you're gonna have asphalt in precipitation when you have about 30% uh, injected gas, uh, around 8,000 PSI is going to precipitate some of the asphalt in. We have published the results of the lab test in this SPE 200-429 that I recently presented at the Tulsa IOR meeting. For now, let's switch to onshore shale. The interesting thing about onshore shale is the initial gas requirement that you need to have in order to repressurize your SRV. And as, show, as shown here, uh, the more connectivity between matrix and fracture, the more gas you need to inject to pressurize your SRV volume. That's the first part. The second part is the injection rate. As you would expect, the slower the injection rate, the higher the volume that you need to have to um, pressurize the reservoir. So these are the two considerations that you need to have when, when you start your, your pilot test. In terms of uh, some of the field results, here are some of the examples that um, they have published in the literature by some operators. And uh, the results of several uh, pilot tests are shown here. And as you can see, the results of EOR indicate an uplift or incremental recovery between as low as 13% on the very right-hand right side, right corner, up, up corner, all the way to 49% on the bottom left corner, 49%. So that incremental recovery is due to gas injection half and half in these um, wells. So that 50% that I used at the beginning of my presentation is pretty much a good ballpark to remember in terms of the recovery factor that you would get by injecting gas. So I'm gonna conclude my talk at this point. Um, first of all, um, significant EOR resource exists in the deep on offshore as well as onshore shale areas. And these are the target areas that would be suitable for, for any kind of UR, specifically for gas injection. Now, gas injection for UR has proven to be successful onshore. In terms of offshore gum application, we still have limited uh, number of tests and hopefully we'll have more. Um, but then like anything else, these are dependent on the crude oil price and the price is gonna be determine the application or the, uh, the encouragement uh, for the uh, operators to go ahead and switch to ER application. Natural gas or CO2 could be choice gases for ER in both shale and deep offshore. Laboratory and simulation studies for the BHP field show miscibility between injected gas and oil, which underpins good recovery factor. And based on what I have seen so far from other fields and other operators, most of the operators expect full miscibility if they start injecting gas. Shale EOR is promising, but price sensitive. And as I mentioned, $40 is pretty much the marginal price that you wanna have before you can apply EOR. Offshore ER application will require shared injection production facilities amongst the neighboring operators. The whole idea here is instead of having a single application, you may want to have a shared platform where you have a compressor facility and that the injection can be shared by several operators in their field. And this way you can reduce the cost of your injection and make it more economic. And finally, plan for gas injection should be included in the development phase of offshore fields in order to accommodate future EOR application. And this is something that not only is applicable for offshore for their platform and the design of a space and so on, it's also important for onshore, as I mentioned, by the proper design of facilities, you can minimize the cost and hence 
make the ER application more economic. That pretty much concludes my talk. And I'd like to open this up for any questions that you might have and uh, we can uh, discuss it further. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Fasi. I placed uh, some of the questions uh, that I received so far in the, your uh, private chat. You can find at least you have five questions so far. Do you want me to unshare my, uh, my slide? Uh, no, you can keep it uh, now because maybe there are some things that you want to show in your uh, slides, but up to you. I can say you can, uh, you can find the question in the, your chat box. Okay. I, let's see, I need can to, you see? Maybe, maybe you can read them for maybe me. Maybe I can read it for you. The first question uh, uh, from the Dr. Mahmoud Khani. Could you please comment on economics of gas EOR? Uh, yeah, good question. Basically, uh, economics of gas EOR, um, uh, whether you're talking about onshore or offshore, um, they are very, as I mentioned, very price sensitive. And, um, but if the, 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 the right price in terms of volume, uh, you are gonna be getting a good increment uh, on top of your primary recovery uh, for onshore. Uh, we are dealing between 50, 40 to 50% on offshore. You are dealing between 10 to 15% on top of your primary recovery. So volumetrically, you are getting a good volume in terms of cost, obviously, the cost of compression, the cost of facilities and processing and so on are gonna be adding to the cost of your operation. And hence, you need to have the right price to make it uh, a good return on, on your capital. Okay. Next question is from the Dr. Puladi Darvish. Uh, can you expand on the issue of the asphalting problem? Many reservoir fluid to show the asphalting precipitation, but not all have been a real problem against development using gas methods. Can you comment how one uh, could judge whether asphalting will cause a real problem? Yeah, yeah, Mehran, uh, this is a good question. And our paper uh, that we presented in Tulsa was basically about this issue. Um, the main problem with, with asphalting issue is we, we were not quite sure whether there would be some sort of permeability impairment in the reservoir, because we are pretty much sure that asphalting does not cause any issue around the injection well, because by just injecting gas, you're moving that oil away from the injector and hence the chances of having any kind of injectivity impairment is very low. We also know that producers generally have issues with the asphalt in dropout because of the low pressure and also because once gas breaks through, the high gas uh, volume is gonna, uh, or the solvent is gonna drop more asphalt in around the producer, but that's also uh, uh, you can mitigate that as well by injecting xylene and other um, asphaltine uh, mitigation um, is, uh, 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 liquid. The, the key is in the reservoir. And, uh, and so uh, two or three things could be happening. We did notice about uh, 40 to 50%, probably 60% permeability impairment in those core tests that we carried out. However, the level of impairment, we don't expect to drastically impact the, the reservoir performance. However, one thing that's gonna happen is because of the dropout of the asphalt in, in the high permeability zone, we feel that's gonna help with the, uh, the coverage that you would expect to see in the reservoir. In other words, improve the vertical coverage by making the higher perm zone less permeable and hence move that gas into the uh, lower permeable zone. So that's one of the aspects could be happening. The second aspect could be the, because of the dropout of asphalt in, uh, in at reservoir condition, the API of your oil is gonna improve in the producing well and, and hence uh, 
you probably are going to expect between four to five API improvement in your production well. So these are two or three things that, that um, could be happening. Our recommendation is that you need to include asphalting precipitation mechanism in your reservoir uh, uh, performance prediction or reservoir model and using PC shafts and other reservoir um, uh, uh, packages you could use to um, model asphalt in precipitation and then look at it as a whole uh, in terms of what's going to happen in the overall recovery of, of your, um, your um, gas injection. Next question is from the Dr. Mahmoud Khani. How CO2 compares with the HC for EOR? How CO2 compares with hydrocarbon for EOR? Yes. Um, when you look at the minimum miscibility pressure, CO2 is always competitive, in fact, better than any hydrocarbon in lowering the minimum miscibility pressure. The way I have seen it generally between 500 to 1000 PSI difference when CO2 MMP, uh, when you look at the CO2 MMP compared to hydrocarbon gas. So already CO2 is helping you with the minimum miscibility. It also has additional benefits in terms of vaporization, in terms of swelling and so on. So uh, that is, those are the positive aspects of CO2. The, the negative side of CO2 impact is in the processing facility. If you have hydrocarbon gas injection, you really don't need to have another CO2 rejection in your production facility. But when you're injecting CO2, you need to definitely include that as part of your, your operation. Um, um, uh, the, the other aspect is uh, you need to be careful about uh, CO2 corrosion in some of the lines. And, and, and make, make sure that the lines are all compatible with, with CO2. So there are positive, there are some negatives and so on. Okay. Next question is from the Dr. Donishi. What gas volumes would be required for EOR in, the, in a 10,000 feet horizontal well with 200 fractures? Uh, <laughs> I, I need to go and calculate Dr. Donishi. Um, but it is going to be a significant volume. When you're talking about 10,000 feet and then the, the whole SRV volume, and as I mentioned in terms of that connectivity that you have between matrix and your fracture, you probably are going to be injecting um, for a few days uh, at a very good rate before you start uh, um, pressurizing that, that, that zone. Um, one aspect that I didn't mention in my presentation, and that's really important to, to also remember, is before you, drink, before you start doing any kind of gas injection, you need to be careful about the neighboring wells. For example, the two very extreme wells in, in your block, you probably want to pressurize those so that this gas, when you start injecting, it doesn't start finding the fastest way out of the uh, uh, your SRV and move on to adjacent wells. And one of the things that people have recommended is injecting water in the neighboring wells and keep them under pressure during the injection cycle. Okay. Next question is from the Dr. Mahmoud Khani. What about the hybrid system like thermal gas or water gas for unconventional ER? Absolutely. In fact, uh, in fact, I even want to suggest a better hybrid system. Of course, my presentation here was about gas injection, but other hybrid system people have recommended is injecting surfactant during fracking followed by gas injection. This way, the surfactant impacts the actual oil that is bound to the rock. Gas is starting to vaporize some of the uh, liquid in the fractured side, so you are recovering both of them back. Definitely look for the hybrid system. Uh, injecting water and gas in an unconventional uh, uh, reservoir, I feel a little bit um, uncomfortable on that one. I can see that uh, in injecting water and gas for offshore environment is something that will improve your sweep efficiency. But in an unconventional world, 
uh, if I feel like that water is going to start plugging some of the perms that need, we need for gas to go and contact the oil in the matrix. So potentially you don't want to have a wag injection, but anything that is uh, during the fracking, you potentially can use some chemicals to help with the gas injection, with the follow up gas injection. That's something that could be looked at, yes. Next question is from the Dr. Sultanpur. As far as I know, in Canada, wells are well connected in the shale reservoirs. Is, there, is it possible to have a successful CO2 injection while having well connections? Um, you're talking about, uh, when you're talking about well connection, you're probably talking about frack hits, if I'm not mistaken. So if you're talking about frack hits, yes. Um, Any time that you have that kind of connectivity, um, your uh, your injected gas is not going to be able to uh, contact the uh, in situ oil. So the the, the recommendation is um, look for wider well spacing uh, areas for your gas injection, not too too tightly uh, uh, close to each other. Next question is from the Dr. Orangi. The asphaltine dropout happens at 8,000 PSI after injection uh, and abundant pressure in, is 7,000. Within, within this 1,000 PSI, how much productivity or production can be lost? Yeah, so that, exactly. And, and that's what you're talking about. Once you start injecting gas, definitely around your producer, as you start having gas breakthrough, you're gonna have more asphaltine dropout, for sure. And hence, your, your uh, asphaltine mitigation should be in place in, around your producer. In, at reservoir conditions, as I mentioned, potentially that asphaltine dropout is probably gonna help your sweep. And, but that's something that we need to model and, and do um, additional work to understand the actual benefits or, or, or the negative side of that kind of uh, deposition. Next question is from the Sayed. For conventional reservoirs, we do have an established ER screening tools KPI. Any comments on ER a screening criteria or a screen tools, if available any, to select the right EOR technique in unconventional reservoirs? Great question. And I'm going to plug my uh, paper in the upcoming SPE annual meeting that is going to be in Houston. I'm going to have a joint paper with uh, Professor Tony Kopschek from Stanford. And we'll be presenting some of the screening criteria that we have come up with for EOR application in unconventional reservoir. So watch this space. <laughs> okay, next uh, question is from the Dr. Eskandari. Uh, historically, among those offshore cases mentioned in your presentation, is there a case in which CO2 being used for injection? Uh, yeah, uh, there have been, um, as far as I know, two or three cases that they have used CO2 for offshore EOR. If you, if you want, I can send you a reference. Maybe you can uh, send me um, your email and I can uh, forward you maybe uh, one or two papers related to those offshore CO2 injections. Okay, next question is from the Dr. Mahmoud Khani. Is there a, is there a minimum dollar per barrel to make gas ER attractive in terms of the ROI, CAPEX seems to be the key factor, isn't it? Definitely, CAPEX is number one thing uh, for any ER application, especially for offshore. And the main reason is because you're dealing with injecting high pressure gas, sometimes above 10 to 11,000 PSI into these deep reservoirs. And hence your, your compressor is not just one, two. It's a, you have a row of compressor that you need to have. So that is a driver. The minimum dollar per barrel, as I mentioned, 
um, generally speaking, you are probably talking about between seventy to eighty dollars per barrel for offshore. For onshore, it's around forty. Forty will make it possible to to apply EOR. But for offshore, you, you either the capex should come down, or the price should go up. Excellent. Last question is from the Dr. Puladi Darvish. You kindly commented on requirements uh, for cap rock integrity studies for some gas injection product project. Uh, have uh, there been standards or protocols developed for testing, modeling, and monitoring that you could refer to? Uh, yeah, so basically, if you look at the literature for uh, uh, cap rock integrity, um, especially those who are working on oil maturation studies, uh, geoscience world, uh, looking at the, the integrity of uh, hydrocarbon column and, and what kind of uh, cap rock can withstand a certain uh, gas column or hydrocarbon column. You can see many, uh, I mean, uh, the literature is pretty rich on those. For this specific case, obviously you are displacing oil with a gas and then this gas is going to be under high pressure. So there are two aspects of uh, cap rock integrity. One is the geomechanical aspect where you need to make sure that it doesn't uh, uh, fracture under these high pressure condition. But on top of that is a capillary uh, uh, aspect of this where the entry pressure for uh, gas going into the cap rock uh, is hopefully bigger than the gas pressure uh, adjacent to this cap rock. So those are the kind of studies that need to be done whenever we are thinking about gas injection. Excellent, excellent. Once again, thank you Dr. Fasihi for accepting our invitation and for such a wonderful presentation and all the participants for taking part in this event. And just for your information, a recorded version of the today's webinar will be available in the APPIH social networks by end of today. Thank you. For Thank you. I mean, just, uh, no problem. It's my honor. I, I hope you can go and edit some parts of this because I'm sure it wasn't smooth. <laughs> no, no, no. Thank you so much. It was wonderful. All right. Thank yeah. you, everybody, Thank for you. attending this talk yeah. and looking forward for future talks. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Have a wonderful day. Okay. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.